Look, I'm going to start here. I'm going to just be flat honest. Normally, normally on a day like today when I prep for messages and I, and I, and I pray and seek God, Lord, I, I don't want God, I don't want manly wisdom, Lord, I want you to speak. And the majority of the time, the majority of the time, God gives me and I feel like I have a solid, clear path, clear vision of what he wants to communicate and wants to say. And I've wrestled with this one. I've wrestled with what I'm going to say today, not because I'm going to say anything controversial at all, but it is something that is speaking, that does speak into the times, that does speak into what is happening. And then as I'm asking, I was like, God, I, this is not the normal feel here. This isn't, this isn't the play. I, I do not understand why it seems so unclear, why it seems so vague. And, and I'm going to be honest, I still don't know. I, I don't know. I know what I'm going to say, even though it doesn't look like it right now. I do know what I'm going to say, but it is, I'm just being honest. I feel a little different. But see, I feel like maybe that's what he's trying to communicate because the, the whole point of today is, the, is circled around this idea of duty. What is our duty? And we are to fulfill our duty whether we understand the big picture or not, whether we understand how it's going to work out or not, whether we understand even if it's going to work or not, we are still called to do our duty. So my duty is to proclaim God's word, and it's up to him to do the rest. Because it's not on me. It is not on me or my intellect or my, my speaking ability. It's on him. It's just my job is to play my part. God's going to do his. It's up to us to play our part. And really, that's, that's something that has been weighing on my heart, really, when we're looking at all of this. Because... Let's be honest, if you look online and you look at the, the state of the nation and everybody and their conversations, doesn't the problem seem too big to solve? Yes or no? Or am I the only one on that? The problem seems like it is too big to solve. Like how are we going to, with, with the amount of information that we have, which with the internet is great, it's a blessing and a curse, because we have all of the correct and all of the incorrect information. It is, it's sometimes hard to tell. It's sometimes hard to tell with so much out there how to process everything. And the problem seems too big to fix. And if that's, if that's how you feel, well, that's good. You should feel that way because the problem is too big. You and I are not the world's savior. It's not on us. You and I are not the world's savior. It is bigger than that. And we all we are called to do is our part. Listen, God's going to accomplish his will Regardless if you like it or not, he's going to accomplish his will. It's up to us. It's up to you if you want to play a part on the right side of eternal history. Now, this weekend was the 4th of July, and, and I love history. I, you know, for me, I, I do believe in that, uh, that, that quote. You've, I'm pretty sure you've all heard it saying, if you don't know your history, you're going to be doomed to repeat it. But I also believe in the same way. It's hard to know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. And to me, I love history. Now, the founding era, American history, I love it. And there's a lot of nasty and beautiful things. Miracles, massacres, heroes, villains, it's all there. And we can't be, it's, it's hard to, you know, you want to only maybe see sometimes the good side of it. You don't want to see the bad. And then there's the opposite. Then those who only hype on the bad refuse to see some of the good. But this is something that, that has inspired me and that I, is related to something that Jesus communicated on what we, how we are supposed to live in our time. Those in the founding era, half of who the founding fathers are more than just the two or three or four that you learned in American history. There was considered over 200 some odd founding fathers, women included as well. And many of them, over half of them were seminary degrees. All right, these guys knew the word of God and they felt in their heart a sense of duty to God and country. And this is not something that they just created on their own. They felt that this is the legacy. The legacy of the church is that, listen, we have, regardless of what kingdom you, and regardless of what country you live in, if you're a believer in Christ Jesus, you are a part of a kingdom. And we have to understand the fact that we have a duty to be dual citizens of the kingdom of God while we live here in the country of mankind. And it matters. And what we do, all we are called to do is to play our part to expand the kingdom of God here in this 
nation, because this is where we live. We live in, for those of you that are watching online, listening, those of you living here, right? This is where we live. What are we called to do? Those that, when I look at history, those in the, the founding era, they had a strong sense of duty that says, listen, we are called to do. And this is why when we celebrate the Declaration of Independence, that is the America's mission statement, which I love that part in, in, in history. America's a little different compared to all the other countries. If you are a part of, you ever come from another country, your Independence Day is different than ours, right? Most, day, most countries celebrate the day they won independence. We don't celebrate that. We don't celebrate the day we won independence. We celebrate the day we declared to say, look, this is who we want to be. This is our goal in life. This is our mission. This is what we want America to be. We celebrate the day we decided, right? That's it. Listen, you and I, you all have goals, I'm sure. You got goals for yourself. You, or maybe you wrote them down, right? You have goals for yourself. And, and you know, hopefully this doesn't put it on a, on a negative on you. How, how good are you right now? Where are you with your life goals? You know, maybe you're happy. Maybe you're like, oh, geez, bro, I'm, I'm here to be encouraged. And, you know, I, maybe you're not where you want to be. But the, is the problem the goal? No, I mean, there's so many things to that. But that's the beauty about our goals. Goals are something that should be something greater, bigger than ourselves. Unattainable, really, right? You ever heard that phrase, hey, you know, shoot for the moon and you'll land among the stars, right? Now that, that's cute, right? But that's kind of the idea, right? It's like goals are something like, dude, this is who I want to be, even if I don't become it, as long as I'm close to it. Well, that's what you have to understand. That's when they wrote all, they, when they wrote that all men are created equal, I've read their notes. I've seen the documents. They meant all people, not just whites. And when they said liberty and justice for all, they meant that that was the goal. Yet, obviously, we see history has not played out perfectly, right? It hasn't played out perfectly for everybody. When the, the war was over, a lot of people became free. And there's stories. It is so sad to see how many stories have been lost to history. Not just there were whites, Native Americans, Hispanics, and blacks that did win their freedom and did go on to create and do amazing things right after that Revolutionary War. But obviously, we know not everybody was free. And the founders were bothered by this. I've, I've read their articles. I've read their letters when, when some of them would, years later, they would lament. And they were like, man, we had a shot. As much as they accomplished, they looked back at, at what they did. And they still, there were some that still felt, man, we missed an opportunity. We could have ended slavery and we missed it. We could have did this. We, did, we missed an opportunity. How many of us have felt that? You know that's like, right? You go and you look back at your life and all you're going to see is... Missed opportunities. Man, if I, if I would have done that, oh, if I would have done this, if I could have, if I should have, if I knew better. Well, they were no different than us. But the thing about what, what they understood is common sense that we understand today. Those founders knew that the problem was too big for one generation. It was too big for one war. And the reality is, is that the fight for liberty and justice did not end at Yorktown. It still goes on. It is a never-ending fight because we have, because of who we are as people, because of, because of evil in this world. Until Jesus returns, no nation will be perfect. No nation until Jesus returns. Yet what are we supposed to do? Well, the founders knew, listen, our, the problem is too big for us to fix. And they had hope that the next generation would finish what they started, and they had hope that the next generation would correct the mistakes that they made. Look, if you're a parent, I'm pretty sure you feel that way, right? You know that, look, I can only do so much, and hopefully my kids are better than me. Hopefully my kids are a little better than I was. I mean, that's, that's the hope of every parent. Well, the founders were no different. That's how they felt. They were hoping that the next generation would do their part because they felt that they were just doing their part compared to previous generations themselves. All it was, how can we do our part to move forward? What it was our duty to do our best. In fact, even the way that the Constitution was written, listen, the, the, the Constitution is just like, a, almost very similar to the, top, the, the Ten Commandments, 
right? Have you noticed how many negative commandments are in there? It's because the Ten Commandments that God gave is a charter of negative liberties. It says, listen, if you don't do this, 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 then you're free, then you're happy. Well, the Constitution is the same thing. It, it's a bunch of negative liberties, limiting government. But because why? The, they limit all these things to say government can't do this because the implication is you and I are supposed to do the rest. You and I have a duty to play. And they tried to create a system that would be the best, you know, what it could be so that people can play their part. And again, yes, it wasn't perfect. They didn't get everything right. And they knew this. That's why they were hoping the next generation would fix it. And the next generation would play their part. Because it is a never-ending fight. And, the re- and this is where it seems overwhelming, right? It's like, man, it's, what can we do? Can we really make a difference Who am I? Who are you? Who are we? Because the problem is too big for us, and you're right. The problem is too big for us, but it's not too big for God. It's not too big for God. It's not at all. And that's where we have to learn to not put our eyes on self, but on him. Because listen, we have a God-given duty to serve Those in this country, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, listen, you have a God-given duty to serve those in this country by expanding and championing the kingdom of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have that duty. And listen, we have to know that balance because how many people in history have, in the name of God and country, done horrific things? But there are many who, in the name of God and country, did great things. So who are we going to? to be? Who are you going to choose to be? And this is where we have to realize, look, I know the problem is big, and it is bigger than anything, bigger than our generation. We won't fix it. No generation will do that until Jesus returns. But then, so what do we do? Well, do you know that the apostles were actually overwhelmed when Jesus actually commanded them and showed them, this is the expectation that I have for you. Jesus says, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, all right, here's the level, here's the standard. And the apostles felt overwhelmed. Like, they're like, we can't do that. How can we ever do that? Well, then Jesus gave him a lesson on, look, all you have to do is your part. And God will do the rest. And so we're going to look at that. Let's look at Luke 17. Luke 17 is, uh, is the anchor text for today. And I'm going to just read verse 1 through 10. Now, if, uh, as you read along, some of these things, and you know, some of you, if you've read the Bible before, it's going to sound a little familiar. Others, it's going to feel disconnected. It's going to feel choppy, but let me tell you, this is all one lesson that Jesus is trying to teach his people then that we are called to follow through on today. So let's read. We're going to put it on the screen so those of you guys either here or online can watch. Here's Luke 17, 1 through 10. Jesus said to his disciples, offenses will certainly come, but woe to, you, the, woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and were thrown into the sea for him to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. And if, the, and if he sins against you seven times in the same day and comes back to you seven times that same day and says, I'm sorry, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostles replied to Jesus, they said to the Lord, increase our faith. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, the Lord said, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted, be planted in the sea, and it will obey you. So which one of you, having a servant, tending sheep or plowing, will say to him, when he comes in from the field, come at once and sit down and eat? No, instead, instead will not the master tell him, Prepare something for me to eat. Get ready. Serve me while I'll eat and drink. Later, you can eat and drink. Does he, the master, thank the servant because he did what was commanded? It's a rhetorical question because the answer is no. In the same way, when you have done all that you were commanded, you should say we are worthless servants. We have only done our what? We've only done our duty. Now, all of that kind of sounds random, but you got to check the big picture of what Jesus was trying to do. He, he puts the standard of life. Listen, here's what I want you to do. You need to live in this way. Offenses will happen, meaning you will make mistakes. People will 
do things that will offend others, or in, in essence, really, when he's talking about is this form of being a bad example, right? Because here's the thing, guys. Listen, bad interpretation of God's word leads to bad application, Okay, bad interpretation of God's word leads to bad application and leads to a bad example. So what he's saying is, look, offenses are going to come. You're not going to get everything right. There's going to be mistakes here and there. But here's how I want you to live. If you see someone make an offense, if you see someone in error, if you see someone who is mistaken, if you see someone who's believing the lie of the enemy, what are we supposed to do? Hey, tell them to repent. Right? And repenting just kind of, no, that, that for some of us, it's like, look, God's not telling you condemn or, con, you know, not, nothing like that, name calling, not like that. To rebuke someone, to rebuke someone to repent is saying, listen, in love, you're wrong. Because if that person is an error, they will fall in error. They will lead a deceived life and they will deceive others. So we are called to encourage one another, love one another, rebuke each other if we're in the wrong. But even if that offense offends you, and I love Jesus' point, right? Even if it happens seven times in one day, you need to do what? You forgive them. You must forgive them. That's a like, what? Like, I mean, that's hard, right? Let's be hard. If the same person did the same thing to you seven times, you can be like, I don't want to look at you right now. Like, you need to, you need to go. You need, right? I mean, three times, right? Four, seven. Could you imagine? And Jesus is saying, no, every time, if he is sincere in his heart, you must forgive him. So the response, this is where the, the apostles, what do they respond in saying? Woo, Jesus, you need to increase our faith then. I, I can't do that. I doubt that I will live in that way. I doubt that I will have the courage to either rebuke someone in the right way. I doubt that I'm going to have the courage to not be offended or offensive. I doubt that I can forgive someone at that level. That is a lifestyle that I can't do. So Jesus, increase our faith because I'm going to need more faith to live like that. I'm going to need more faith to feel like doing the right thing. And then Jesus says, in essence, he says, uh, hold on. They kind of had it right, but then they didn't. Because, yes, they realized that, whoa, okay, God, in asking Jesus to increase our faith was a recognition of God being God. And, and they're seeing the divinity of Jesus there. But they're missing the big point because Jesus says, hold on, hold on. You don't need big faith. You don't need big faith to do big things. Even if you just had a small mustard seed sized faith, you can tell, and he gives another exaggerated statement, I can tell this plant, this fake plant right here, right, or do this, uproot yourself, chuck yourself into the Gulf of Mexico, right, and it'll happen, right? And he uses that as like, look, you don't need big faith to do big things. You just need faith in a big God. That's it. You, need, you, don't, need, you don't need big faith to do big things because our faith, when God does miracles in us, it's not because we have miracle-producing faith. No, it's because we have faith in a miracle-producing God. That's, that's him. It's not us. It's Christ Jesus in us. And so we say, Whoo, I can't live like that, God. I need more faith. It's like, no, no, no. You just need to exercise the faith you have. You just need to walk in faith. I don't care if it's little, whatever it is. What matters is not the size of your faith. What matters is the size of the object of your faith. It's a big God. You don't need big faith to do big things. You just need faith in a big God. That's it, to do big things. But then he, Jesus takes the perfect opportunity and then throws that random story. Let's be honest. Maybe some of you were reading and that's where you, you maybe got lost. What is Jesus talking about? Because he goes from saying, you know, you can live with this kind of mustard seed faith. You can do miracles. You can do big things. And then he says the story of someone who does mundane small, ridiculous, insignificant chores and has a master who does not appreciate the servant. And Jesus says, that's the attitude you're supposed to have. What is the whole point? Jesus is teaching one lesson here and it's about our duty. The apostles thought, well, we need great faith to be able to fulfill our duty. He's like, no, you don't. All you need to do is exercise the faith that you have because duty requires discipline. This is why in the military, right, a sense of duty is, is huge because duty means I am doing the right thing even though I do not love what I'm going through. Listen, there's chores around the house I hate doing. I know you have yours. Everybody has theirs. If you love doing all those chores, something's wrong with you. I'm just sorry. I'm just saying there's something. You know, something's wrong with you. Look, I got chores I hate doing, but I do them because I love my wife. And so I know, like, look, I... 
do not like this, but I do what is right. Not because I love doing what I'm doing. It's because I love who I'm doing it for. I love who I'm doing it for. And that's where the sense of duty comes in. That's why those who serve in the military, there's things that they go through that I'm sure the training and the exercises and the, the mundane things that they do that they don't love doing it, but why do they do that? Why do they sacrifice so much? Why do they, the, why do, they do that? It's because of who they're doing it for, right? And it's the same for us. When it comes to doing our duty, the big things, and again, you don't miss on the small. Because Jesus says even the, when we obey the master, it's not just doing, living the Jesus life, living like Jesus' followers requires us that we walk in faith in the big things and even in the small. And we do our duty, we obey our master being Christ Jesus, even if we go underappreciated, even if no one notices, if no one says thank you, because that's the servant in this story. The master here, he just says, hey, he comes in. He doesn't say, hey, man, you've had a long day. Why don't you take a break, relax? I'll fix myself something. You can. No, he says, and the master says, hey, I'm hungry now. Feed me, do what I need to do. Do what you need to do, and then you can. See, Jesus didn't want the apostles to miss the big idea. Look, we're supposed to be, as Jesus' followers, we're supposed to be change agents in the world because Jesus changes us and desires for us to be change agents. We're supposed to be a thermostat, not thermometers in this world. You know the difference, right? Some of y'all got scanned on the way in here today. Some of y'all, you're probably been scanned depending on what place you've been to or what you've done, right? I know like for any, any little thing, if you get a little, little <clears throat> you're like, Jesus, not me. No, 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 right? And we all kind of like, wait, am I? Am I? Whew. All right, I know everyone's kind of panicked on that. But uh, what does a thermometer do? A thermometer just says, hey, it's hot, it's cold, here's the temperature. The thermometer is just says the truth of what is the environment. A thermostat changes the environment. A thermostat, when set, changes the environment. As Jesus Christ, as, as believers in Christ, we are thermostats. We are called to change the environment wherever we are. That is who we're called to be. And we do that. We do that change, not in our strength, not in our big faith. We don't have faith in faith. No, we have faith in Christ, faith in God. He it is the hand of God that alters our hearts, the thermostat of our heart that changes us. And as a, ref as a ramifications, as we as change, when the settings of our heart is changed, those, the environment around us are called to change. But do not lose sight of this right here because you are supposed to do your duty. Obey Christ. Obey Christ. Even in a world that will ridicule you for it, reject you for it. Listen, it is not your responsibility on how other people respond to the gospel. It is not your responsibility on how they respond. It is your responsibility to respond, to act, to live. And we don't do it in our strength. We do it in faith. In Christ Jesus. All Jesus is saying when he said, when the apostles were like, we need faith, we need big faith to accomplish big things. No, just exercise. It is your duty to exercise the faith that you have in me. It is your duty to exercise the faith you have in me, even if you don't feel like it. That's that kind of discipline there. To do that kind of manual labor, that, that, that guy's servant, man, to have that kind of manual labor, he's doing it. And notice, for because... What is his motivation? Well, Jesus revealed it. He says, look, the whole point, your attitude should be the servant's attitude. To be able to live in this way, you got to think like the servant. And what did the servant say? Oh, well, he didn't thank you. He didn't do it. So what, what is our response? We are worthless servants. We've only done our duty. Now, this isn't some poor person who doesn't understand his self-worth and value. That's not it at all. That word worthless, or it gets translated unprofitable. What he is saying is this servant says, look, I have done. I don't need to live for the affirmation of man. I don't need to live for the approval of others. I don't need, no, I've done my duty because, listen, this man, in this case, in the servant, the master, owes me nothing. He doesn't owe me anything. It is my duty to do what I've accomplished. And here, that's God is saying, listen, when it comes to God, our attitude should be to God. Listen, our, God doesn't owe me anything. I don't know how you feel, but listen, Jesus does not owe me anything. If, if all he did was forgive my sins and that's it, that's more than enough. I don't even deserve that. He doesn't even owe me that. 
God doesn't owe me forgiveness. He doesn't owe me that. So when I, when God has commanded me to do my part, to play my part, God doesn't owe me a thank you. He doesn't owe me a thank you. I do it because I am thankful for what he has done in my life. I don't do what I do because God owes me honor. No, I do it because it is an honor to serve him. I don't do it so that God can give me a reward. I do it because he is my reward. That's it. That is the attitude that we are called to have. It is we operate and we do what we are called to do and have that discipline because of who he is and because of what he's done. Yet, listen, we don't have a master like the one Jesus said. I mean, we don't. Jesus is not like that. For Jesus, our master says, I did not come to, ser to uh, be served, but to serve. We have a master in Christ who does serve us, who does encourage us, who does help us, who does not abuse us. We have a master in Christ Jesus who truly loves us, who sacrifices himself, who has put us in, in position and done all that he could for us. That is the master we have. We have a master who says, I will honor those who humble themselves. We have a master who will give us rewards in the end for what we've done. But all of that is just the icing on the cake. We don't need, God doesn't owe us any of that, yet he decides to give it to us. That is why he is so good. And it is our duty to play our part in this time, regardless of how big the problem is, because it is our duty knowing that the solution, Christ Jesus, is so much bigger. Our faith is not in ourselves, in our intellect, in our strength. It is in Christ. All we are called to do our part. And Jesus later in Luke 19, just a couple chapters later, repeats and gives one little lesson and says, listen, talks about duty. And he says, look, the king tells a story of a king entrusting his servants with something. And the king went away and would come back later. Speaking of, Jesus is, this is right before Jerusalem. So he is showing them, in essence, I'm going to hand something to you all. And I'm going to go away. And until I come back, you need to occupy until I return. You need to engage in kingdom business until I return. It is our duty to do our part until Jesus comes back and finishes the job. But then he says this story of servants who have been given something precious. And some servants reject that king. They don't want that king, so they, they don't care. They don't play their part. And then you have other servants who some did what they did and others didn't. But the whole point of that whole story is, listen, you are called to play your part. Regardless. Regardless if, if, if people affirm you. Regardless if people appreciate you. No, we do it for the glory of God and for the good of others. And really, when we see this whole thing, when I look at Luke 19 and Luke 20, I believe that Jesus was trying to teach this one thing that one of our founding fathers, John Quincy Adams, said. It's one of my favorite quotes of his. It says, duty is ours. Results are God's. Duty is ours. Results are God's. Listen, John Quincy Adams was a teenager during the American Revolution. He and his father, I mean, they were staunch abolitionists along with so many others. And he was, he was 14 and, you know, 70, and he had a sense of duty from God to serve this nation, to do what he needed to do. But he was only a teenager. His father's generation could not accomplish everything that they wanted to accomplish. There were certain things that they did that they, not, they did not foresee this happening or the culture going this way. And so John Quincy was like, look, my, gen, my father's generation did their part. My duty is for me to do my part. And he had a strong sense. And so he goes and dedicates his life to public service, runs, becomes a president of the United States, did not accomplish everything he wanted to accomplish as president, and does then the crazy thing. He doesn't retire like most presidents do. Now, the dude then runs for Congress and spends the rest of his life in Congress trying to fight for the end of slavery, to try to finish what his father's generation could not do. I mean, this guy was such a monster that they called him the hellhound of abolition. I mean, this dude, I mean, this is all he cared about. And year after year, he stood. Year after year, he spoke. Though he was ridiculed, though he was, I mean, they created a gag order to keep this guy from stop talking about this. But he knew, listen, my duty is to do my part. Duty is mine. It's re the results are God's. All I can do is my part. Year after year, year after year, even when he stood alone, he kept on doing his part, kept on doing his part. At the end of his life, during his last term, he actually died 
he collapsed in the middle of one of his speeches as he was fighting for with his last dying breath. He was speaking against the wickedness and the evil of what slavery was. He died and collapses and has a heart attack pretty much in the middle of the chambers. And in that last year, he actually made a friend. And this was, we don't know the details of the actual relationship that was made between these two individuals. But here's an old man and he, he finds a young congressman. A young congressman and he befriends him. And, and apparently the relationship was enough that the congressman became one of John Quincy Adams' pallbearers. They only had one year of this term in office together. As John Quincy dies, this uh, young congressman loses re-election and he, he doesn't win until years later when he runs for public office again, he wins and becomes the 16th president of the United States. That's Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln goes and implements everything that John Quincy Adams pretty much had been fighting for and standing for for his entire generation. See, John Quincy did not see the result that he was hoping for. The end of slavery in his lifetime, he died with slavery still being a reality. Yet he knew results are God's. It's my duty to do my part. And it is the next generation for them to do their part. And then the next generation to do theirs. Abraham Lincoln did his part. Yet we see that, hey, it didn't get fixed. Even after the Emancipation Proclamation, even after slavery was abolished, uh, it was another problem. And it it, it keeps on going still today. And that's the reality that every generation is called to play their part. But we as believers in Christ Jesus, we know, listen, duty is ours. Results are God's. All we have to do is play our part. In fact, look at 1 Corinthians. Paul communicates this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're going to put it on the screen so you can see. Look what, look what he says, verse 6 and 7. It says, I, being Paul, I planted. He's talking about the gospel. He's talking about the, the word of God. I planted. Apollos watered. But who gave the growth? God. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is really anything. But only God is the one who gives growth. Doesn't that sound like the, the attitude of the servant that Jesus said? We're just worth the servants. We're just doing our duty. Paul recognizes, says, listen, there's things that I've done that I, I just started, yet Apollos has continued what I've done. There's, and that's the whole point. In the, whether you are planting or watering, we're really nothing. It's God who is doing it. It is God in us. It is God through us. It's him. Duty is ours to obey God. It is results are God's. And Jesus says, he commands us, look, if you love me, you're going to do my commandments. Now, it doesn't mean we have to prove our love for God. No, our actions prove our love for God. Our failure to obey Christ, our failure to live like Jesus is, is because we still, there is still a love for the world in us that needs to die. The heart, it's always a heart issue. When we love Christ, we will do what he has called us to do, even if we don't feel like it. When we love Christ, we can resist temptation, even though there is a part in us that wants to fall, that wants to do it in Christ when we know, but how can I willingly surrender to this kind of sin that murdered my best friend? Why would I do that? Again, love leads us to live. Love leads us to do our duty. And our duty is to take, look, I'm wearing it to hopefully remind you. Our duty is to take the life that Jesus has gave us and the liberty that we have found in Christ Jesus to pursue him, to pursue Christ, to know him and make him known. This is our duty. This is our job to take the life that he's given us and the liberty that we have in Christ over sin and death to pursue him, to know him and make him known. When we pursue Christ in this way, he will fulfill his purpose in your life. Notice I said his purpose in your life, not your own. All right? You might have a purpose. You may have a dream, which is great, but you, we, are, we ought to sacrifice even our hopes and dreams on the cross so that God's purpose can be fulfilled so that he can be glorified. And who maybe some of your purposes might be lined up. It might, it might not. But again, who are we doing this for? It's him. It's him. Listen, there is only a life that can be found in Christ Jesus. Jesus surrendered his life on the cross so that we can have life. Jesus, his liberties were taken from him as he was arrested unjustly, uh, tried unjustly, and murdered unjustly for a crime that he did not commit. Yet he willingly surrendered those liberties so that you and I can be free from sin and death forever. And you and I can only pursue Christ because it is first Jesus who pursues us. We can do because 
because he has done. Listen, you and I, we can be good and faithful servants only because we have a good and faithful Savior. That's it. We are called to be good and faithful, not in our goodness and not faithful in our strength. No, we can only be good and faithful servants because we have a good and faithful God who lives in us. It is Christ who lives in us to give us the ability to do that. Listen, and because Christ lives in us, we are to do our part, whatever it is, whatever it is we are called to do, our part. Because Jesus, look, you and I ought to be activists in this world because the Christ that lives in us is the ultimate activist who is not a passive, who doesn't not just speak, but he does. That's what we're called to do. Being an activist is to look what the Great Commission is, which is a big mission statement in and of itself. No church can go out through the entire world, right? No one single church can go and preach the entire world, baptize everybody, and teach everybody how to live. But just because it's impossible doesn't mean that we are not called to play our part in that big story. That we are called to do our part. That's it. Our duty is God's. Our duty is ours. Results are God's. We can be the, the right kind of activist because it is who Christ is in us. We ought to be advocates for others, advocates who can't speak for themselves or advocates for those who people aren't listening to. We ought to be advocates because we have Christ in us who is the ultimate advocate right now, who is standing in front of the throne advocating for us as we have the devil himself, what the scripture says, who is condemning us before our heavenly father right now. You and I aren't there to defend ourselves. Who is Christ Jesus advocating for our behalf? And because Christ lives in us, we ought to be activists. We ought to, we ought to be those kind of advocates and we ought to be abolitionists still. We ought to be abolitionists still because the great abolitionist lives in us. For Jesus Christ has came to set free every single one who was caught in the chains of slavery, of sin and death. We are called to be those kind of abolitionists, not just to free mankind's soul. Yes, that's part of it and that's the goal, but also to play our part in all of those who are still enslaved to addictions, in, literal enslaved right now, as there are more slaves that live today in this world that actually crossed the Atlantic in ships for over those 400 years of those coming from Africa over here. More slaves live today than those who crossed, in the, crossed the Atlantic in those 400 years. There's a work that needs to be done. There is a work that needs to be done. And it is bigger than any one of us can accomplish. But it's okay. Results are God's. It's our duty to do our part. That's it. Listen, and whatever duty that is, only you know. And the Holy Spirit will lead you. But we are called to do our part. Okay? We don't know when Jesus is going to return. That's what Luke 19 was about. You don't know when the king's going to come back. But you do know, and we do know what we are called to do. And that's play our part. We must obey our master even if no one acknowledges us, even if no one approves of us, even if no one appreciates us. Listen, did that stop Jesus? Did you think people really understood, acknowledged, appreciated, approved of all that he was doing? No. Did it stop him? It didn't stop him. It shouldn't stop us. Because listen, if we, if our duty is not done, and this is what I need you to understand this. If our duty is not done, we and coming generations will be undone because evil never takes a day off. The devil doesn't take a day off. Demons don't take a day off. Evil is never done. This is why the fight always continues on until Jesus comes back and sets things all in order. If we don't play, if we don't do our duty in this time, if we don't play our part in this time, we and other generations will be undone. If we don't do, if we leave our duty undone. But, but we have this in Christ Jesus. If we exercise our faith in love through his Holy Spirit, that's our duty. You know what the God-given result will be? 
Revival. That's it. Revival is the result of God. Yet we position ourselves for that by humbling, exercising our faith in Christ Jesus through love and the Holy Spirit. God, those, that God-given result will be revival. And those transformed lives that will come to pass, those transformed lives are going to be grateful that you remained faithful.